I'd rather create something that others criticize than create nothing and criticize others. If you have high quality product behind the bar, it's like a weapon. It's not about the figures. It's about who those figures are. The Hospopreneurs Podcast. I'm going to drink this beer. Yeah, let's crack it. With James Henderson. Hello and welcome to episode 87 of the Hospopreneurs Podcast. The bio that I'm about to read for my next guest is taken verbatim from The Australian because it summarizes his professional work excellently. John Lethleen is Australia's only national food critic. A journalist by trade, John has written full-time about restaurants, food, and the people involved with this exciting landscape since 1996, and publications including The Age, Delicious, and Gourmet Traveller. End quote. On a bad day, John may be received with some unfortunate names, and we discuss that. But he says what he believes as an objective voice in the media. Now, the courage to do that in an environment riddled with paid ads and cunning advertorials demonstrates his character above his experience as a journalist. I hope you enjoy the conversation we have traversing hospitality, media, technology, and more. Hello, and welcome to the show, John. Thanks very much for having me on the show, James. It's a pleasure to be here. Anytime. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. I'm really excited to get into some of the questions that I have for you today. So as you know, the first question that I normally like to ask is a crazy hospitality story. But I think instead, what I'd like to ask you is, what's your most memorable hospitality experience? Ah, well, I I gave this a little bit of thought and it didn't take long to remember something that actually happened to me many years ago and it was long, long before I had had any contact with the hospitality industry whatsoever. I was just a punter out for dinner one night with my then girlfriend and it was probably back in the late 80s and there was a particular restaurant that had opened in South Melbourne that was getting a lot of attention. You've got to remember in those days the reviewing landscape was quite different but Stephen Downs in The Age had given this restaurant a cracking review and my girlfriend and I thought, let's head down there and check it out. And it was a classic case of a terrific chef being let loose by someone who was paying the bills but mostly consuming most of the beverage stock himself. Yes. And Anyway, we were enjoying a good meal. The food was excellent. It was progressive. It was modern food. We were having a good old time. But uh, the guy who was the owner of the restaurant was weaving around the place playing mine and host and clearly uh, a little tired and emotional. And anyway, he decided he was going to sit down at one table and share his great company with one of his paying guests. And in the process of sitting down, he basically whacked his chair into a pillar which was supporting a vast vase of expensive flowers, water. And uh, anyway, the rest, no. the rest is history. It, it went down with a phenomenal crash and it was sort of just like a metaphor for the restaurant because it crashed pretty soon after too. But I'll never forget, uh, it was a great lesson if you're the host of the restaurant don't go out there and uh, get amongst your customers if you're totally hammered. It holds true today as it did then. Well, that's a memorable one for me. Yes, thank you very much for sharing that one, John. <laughs> I'd also like to know how you define an exceptional hospitality experience. Ooh. I guess it's, uh, it's feeling that something is coming from the heart rather than the head, that the, the rapport or the connection is intuitive rather than some kind of learned by rote lesson, I guess, when someone has that twinkle in the eye and says, welcome or nice to see you or thanks for coming, you really feel that they mean it. Honestly, it could be a little ramen shop. It could be uh, at the top of the tree at a key or uh, some of the other truly great restaurants in Australia. It doesn't matter. If you feel that that person genuinely is pleased to have you in the building, and I don't mean by me, me, I mean by me, anybody, that that hospitality is real. They have something they want to share with you and they're so pleased that you are there to be on the receiving end of what they have to offer. That to me is real hospitality. I guess it's that the feeling that that's the case. I mean, once people have worked in the industry for a long time, they become skilled at delivering that level of emotion in the way that they act. And I that's, use the yeah. term act deliberately because that's what they are, actors on a stage really at the front of house. So That's totally correct. I know that there are people who are just very skilled practitioners who have the ability 
to convey that warmth and emotion and possibly don't feel it. But if I feel it, that's what matters to me. And maybe I should become uh, a little bit more discerning at working out what's an act and what's real. But I think I've got an okay radar for that. At the end of the day, there are so many different places one can spend one's money. I ran a cafe for a short period of my life and I was genuinely delighted when someone walked in the door just to buy a coffee because they were spending their money with me and I needed that money to pay my staff, to pay the coffee supplier, blah, 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 blah. I was genuinely pleased every time someone came in the front door because I was always about a sandwich away from going broke. So you've made a decision to spend your money with somebody, they should be bloody grateful. Why do you do what you do, John? Mm, That's an interesting question. For better or for worse, I've always had a facility with expressing myself in words. I don't know where it came from, but it certainly has nothing to do with education. I'm a quite a poorly educated person. I grew up reading and parented by people who cared about words and I somehow bumbled out of the end of high school with an ability to string words together. And I quite enjoy stringing words together. So in one respect, I, I guess I'm doing what I feel comfortable with. I've always enjoyed consumer journalism, for want of a better word. I grew up as a kid in the country loving motorcycles, for example. I read motorcycle magazines the way some people read form guides in the back pages, the footy pages. I loved reading very strong consumer advocacy in my magazines as a kid. It really inspired me to say what needs to be said. So I've always enjoyed, and I guess because I, as I grew older, as I matured through adolescence and into my 20s, I began to take an interest in food and notice what joy food could bring. I guess I ultimately sort of started to bring that kind of interest in consumer advocacy and reading good copy to the area of food. And I guess probably in my mid-20s, I started reading restaurant reviews and enjoying reading restaurant reviews when they were done well and when they didn't pull their punches and when they said what had to be said. Consequently, I guess 23 years ago, when a uh, A friend of mine who was in it a weekly offered me the opportunity to replace her restaurant critic. I jumped at it and I sort of haven't really turned back. You've developed a very interesting brand in that world and I'm excited to explore that a little bit further. Just before I ask you some questions on that, I'd like to boil down that why into how you define what you do. One, you should never make the mistake that someone would open the page of a magazine and read the first sentence and continue reading. So... First and foremost, I take it as an exercise in trying to attract someone's attention and keep it. It's ground zero of journalism. I was lucky when I finished high school at the tender age of 16 to get a cadetship at the Age newspaper in Melbourne. It was a long time ago and it was a fantastic education in the fundamentals of journalism and writing. And basically, the golden rule is never assume that someone's going to read what you've written. It's why the great And I'm thinking in my sphere, people like Terry Durack, who I respect enormously. It's why I read Terry Durack and everybody reads Terry Durack is because Terry Durack starts a story and keeps taking you through. He keeps providing sentence after sentence, a reason to keep going. And that's what I would hope to do. You can't assume anybody's going to read it. So it has to be readable. I think a lot of the rubbish that's out there these days, for some reason, people just assume someone will read it. I don't agree with that. It has to be readable. It obviously has to be opinionated. The opinion has to be borne out. You have to demonstrate why you've formed these opinions. We have to make sure that if we defame somebody, we can defend it. It's a funny combination of trying to create a readable piece of writing that happens to be around a restaurant, but also help consumers who are making decisions. A new restaurant's open, just getting a lot of press. It's in broadshirt, it's in bloody yada da. Everybody's going wang, bam, thank you, ma'am. Is it worth, Jesus, I can't get out of a restaurant for less than about 350 bucks these days. Is it worth my 350 bucks after babysitter, after taxi, blah, blah, blah. Let's call it a $500 after tax night. I take that responsibility very seriously. And possibly the worst criticism I could get from a reader would be that you got that wrong. It is a waste of my money. Conversely, the finest compliment I can get from someone in the restaurant industry about writing about their thing is you got it. I think if anybody says you got us or you got me or you got us, that's a great compliment as well. It's interesting because what you've discussed there brings in so many factors from various industries into the one discussion. So talking about writing compelling copy, we're talking about a theme or this lens of hospitality retail. We're also talking about building a compelling argument. So that could take the form of all sorts of other things too. So you're bringing these elements Mm. together to write something that really makes people 
feel things and your style has its own criticism. So it's been interesting to hear how you piece that together. How do you deal with that sort of emotionally driven feedback from your critics? I don't see a lot of it, to be honest. As you'd appreciate better than most, Instagram is now probably the forum for exchanges of views on what's published and, you know, whether it's right or wrong. I mean, I'd be interested in throwing the question back at you. And believe you me, I'm thick-skinned and I'm happy to hear it. What sort of things are you thinking about when you refer to my style attracting criticism? Well, having worked in the industry, I have heard from other people who have received unfortunate reviews from you. But I try to look at everything as objectively as possible. Being someone yep. who does commentate on the industry and speaking with someone like yourself who also commentates, we have to enter with that objective view regardless of people's emotions. And I think that I personally believe that that is the only way to make things better, to build better products and to make the industry better, whether it's the retail end or supply side or wherever we look at that just in business generally and in life. Yes, we need to put things delicately sometimes and everyone has a different opinion on what's delicately put, but there is an art to delivering objective feedback. And I think that that is the skill that great commentators have through their various mediums. So that's how I look at that. I agree with that 100%. At the end of the day, I don't want a reader to get to the end of a review and ask themselves, well, what did he think? I want it to be very clear what I thought. Mm -hmm. I don't see any point in putting yourself in a position where you offer opinion if you don't reach some sort of usable conclusion for the reader, yes. i.e. the consumer. And then just referencing back to what you were saying before that, I believe that when in the days when Melbourne had the likes of Claude Farrell and Stephen Downs reviewing for what were then the David Simon Company papers, which became the Fairfax papers, whether you liked what they wrote or not, I believe having good, informed, educated restaurant criticism in Melbourne gave it a head start on Sydney. It wasn't till later that Sydney got the likes of Leo Schofield and then later on people like John Newton and others leading up to Terry Durack. But Melbourne got an earlier start with Epicure section that started in the age prior to Good Living section starting in Good Living. I think it was certainly a factor in Melbourne building a professional, more world-class restaurant scene. So what I'm saying is I agree with your thesis. Criticism helps refine. Mm. Which is the chicken and the egg for that? Is it the industry wanting to be better or the criticism forcing it to be better? I think, and I stress that I'm not in that industry. I'm a consumer. I believe that social media has only helped contribute to the idea that the industry is in its own echo chamber and too many chefs are cooking for other chefs. Too many chefs only listen to other chefs and restaurateurs and sommeliers and people in the industry generally. And if you only listen to an echo chamber, you're only going to hear what you want to hear. So mm. I think it's really important for consumers to have people reflecting on the efforts of the industry who hopefully have a, a feeling for and empathy with and understanding of, quote, unquote, the man in the street or the woman in the street for that matter. And just as the restaurant industry is in its own echo chamber, far too much of what masquerades as the food media these days only talks to the industry, only uh, goes out in search of its next free cocktail or restaurant meal, and only writes to make sure that their mates are still mates with them come Friday evening and a glass of wine is called for. And it's complete and utter bullshit. And it's eroding the value and the worth of real journalism. It disturbs me that there seem to be a, a lot of people out there who don't see the difference between independent commentary and writing for mates. But anyway, mm. there are a lot of people holding jobs around Australia or positions around Australia as contributors who call themselves journalists who have completely forgotten about who they're writing for. And, uh, well, I hope their day will come. I'd like to believe that. 
I appreciate that view and I want to take that in a direction that really questions where that might be heading because earlier you mentioned around technology and for example, the, I'm going to bring this in now, the Instagram influencer, that really blurs that line. So how does that come into play in that world where we have unbiased and biased publications merging? How can people or the consumer navigate to find an objective voice? I guess in the first place, they've got to want to find it. There have been so many examples over the past couple of years of when I have been posting stuff on Instagram as part of my anti-influencer couscous for comment campaign, when people have basically said, well, what does it matter? These people are arriving with a preconceived idea that they will post an quote unquote great review of a place that's going to provide them with a free meal. I mean, it disturbs the hell out of me that there are people who don't think that matters. So they've got to want to find that. I mean, there's always been commercially driven editorial called advertorial or commercially driven editorial that doesn't call itself advertorial. I guess it's just up to you to work out that if there's an advertisement for Toyota on the left-hand side of the double page and a review of a new Toyota on the right-hand side, it glows. You just have to be the kind of person who can join the dots. I thought the explosion of the internet and the opportunity to self-publish whatever the platform was going to be a fantastic thing, but it just kind of has developed this whole community of people who've been fed a little bit of freebie gold dust and love it and just like want to be on the gravy train forevermore. So there's no wacky, crazy, hilarious reviews out there by people who are just independent of any media or anything like that, as far as I can tell. There's people who do it for a living professionally and pay for what they consume and say what they think, hopefully. And there's a whole bunch of other people out there who just want to be part of the PR machine and accept invitations to influence the nights, restaurant openings, da 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 da. And we've sort of the opportunity for this golden voice to come along complete maverick voices, it seems to have been lost. I'd love to be pointed towards some people who offer a real maverick voice in the restaurant scene, whatever the hell they think, regardless of whether they're on the invitation list for the next opening down at Circular Quay or Flinders Lane. You know what I mean? Mm. Personally, I'm totally behind that. I think that that's something that is really required for the independence of media in the industry. But How does the retail end of the hospitality industry receive that idea of objective coverage? Well, I think the smart guys appreciate that the reasoned praise of an established restaurant critic carries far more weight, far more gravitas than the voice of a nobody, for one, and secondly, the voice of someone who accepted a free meal and a couple of bottles of wine on the implicit understanding that they were coming to say wonderful things about their experience. It's another form of advertising. I know influencer marketing works, but um, whether it works in the restaurant industry, I don't know. I think ultimately Australia's restaurant industry is quite competitive and just because people who are given freebies to come along and say so are saying how wonderful something is, is that a recipe for sustainability? I I, I don't think it is. It might be a short-term sugar hit for a business to get off the ground and launch Mm. and if their product is excellent, there'll be repeat business. But I don't know. That's a question for the industry maybe, James. And as I said to you earlier on, I increasingly try and distance myself from the restaurant industry and its issues. So I find it easier to do my job these days by not socialising with or spending any time with. Not that I ever did much, but now that I don't even live in the city anymore, just keeping away from hospitality industry people and just, I don't know, I feel like a stronger consumer advocate than ever before these days. A business has got its goodwill and its assets and its lease and what have you. A person in the media has only got their reputation. And the older I get, the more I realise that compromising on anything that will affect your reputation is short-term thinking. So, Uh, How has your perspective of the industry changed over your career as a commentator? Quite dramatically in recent years. I think just going back to social media, again, Instagram, it's far more instantaneous sort of uh, reflection these days on things. I can remember waiting for letters to come in the snail mail. Then letters would come via email. Now letters don't come at all. Everything is done via social these days. 
days. Nobody even bothers to send you a, an SMS these days to say, thank you for including us or thank you for the review or whatever. When I first started, first at the Melbourne Weekly, then at The Age, and then also at The Australian initially, I used to try and write gossip, the goings on of the restaurant industry. And if I might say so, I was quite good at it because I quite enjoyed going to functions, cultivating relationships with certain people who would tell me things. It made for good copy. If you go back 13 or 14 years and look at espresso in the age or indeed what Short Black used to be in the Sydney Morning Herald, you got a truckload of really good goss in those days for your dollar or fifty or whatever you paid for the paper. Social media and the web has changed the way news is delivered. No one has a secret anymore. It's out there before you can type it. So the idea of doing a weekly column about Chris Lucas's new restaurant or whether Justin Hems has just appointed a new head chef for somewhere or et cetera, et cetera. That idea is almost redundant now. And consequently, I stopped doing that because it just became a redundant exercise and a futile exercise. And by not having to engage with people in the restaurant industry and the hospitality industry at that level anymore, I've been able to stand back and distance myself more because I don't need them for that anymore. And that's been liberating. And this is not a new idea. I can remember Stephen Downs, who reviewed for The Age and then The Sunday Age and then The Herald Sun and has written lots of books and made lots of friends and lots of enemies in the Melbourne media over the years. I can remember Stephen Downs once saying that you can't do both. You can't do journalism about the restaurant industry and also review restaurants with any sense of objectivity. And he was totally right. The fact of the matter is there are very few journalists reviewing restaurants in Australia who are on staff. In fact, I'm going to scratch my head right now and ask myself who they are. Now, Terry Durack at the Herald's not on staff. Jemima Cody, I don't know whether she's on staff or not. I've been told she's not. She may be. If she is, I apologise, but I'm not certain of that. Anthony Huckstep of Delicious isn't on staff. We could go on and on. I'm on staff. And Dan Stock at the Herald Sun is on staff. There are not many of us left on staff. And the problem with being a freelancer is that you've got to float a few boats in the bath to make sure that everything uh, stays afloat. Sometimes that leads to quite strong compromises and conflicts of interests in what you do for a living. Yeah, I'll let other people join the dots, but there are people who do things that render their opinions expressed in the media fairly compromised. Mm. It's interesting hearing, because one of my questions that I ask nearing the end of the episode is how these sorts of things have changed and the innovations that you've seen that have shaped the industry. That's sort of coming into play in your answer there. John, I'm going to take this uh, down a different road. With regards to your own creative flair and flavor, how do you get into a state that allows your ideas to flow? I'm lucky enough to live in a beautiful part of the world at the northern end of the Cape District of Southwest Western Australia. So I'm lucky enough to be sitting talking to you, looking out at a blue sky and my garden. I've pretty much always worked at home for the past sort of 15 years or so. I like to get my pictures up that I've taken during a restaurant visit and scroll through them. I like to do my reviews with people who know what they're talking about. I've got a couple of friends around Australia who I like to do reviews with. And if at all possible, I like to do them with my wife, Kate, who is not only my soulmate and a smart cookie, but is also a cordon bleu trained cookery teacher and who taught cookery professionally in London for five years. And she knows a, a split Bernays from a vinaigrette pretty well. And, you know, we, particularly if it's a restaurant we visited together, we talk about the highs and the lows, putting aside the food. We talk about what are the strong angles of a restaurant that are going to make it worth talking about. I like to play classical music. I don't, I don't play music with lyrics. I play either jazz or classical music. I know nothing about classical music other than I like a good cello concerto. And I know very little about jazz except that I like early 60s jazz. I know quite a lot about 80s pop music and 70s pop music, but I don't listen to that because it just distracts me, James. So mm. I like to sort of get some serenity. But you know what? It's the old story. If I've had a good night's sleep and I'm feeling good, I can write so easily. And if I'm feeling tired and frustrated, I find it very, very hard. And the copy comes out that way. It's leaden. It lacks a sense of humor. It lacks any sort of sense of self-deprecation. You know, at the end of the day, I'm probably the dumbest person in the room. I write for the, in the Australian. We have a pretty high demographic in terms of our readership. There are probably some pretty damn smart cookies who read what's in the Weekend Australian magazine. Mm. So, uh, you know, I'm lucky to have that audience and I like to give them something that if it's not intelligent, at least it's readable and 
It helps them make a decision about a restaurant they might visit. Plus, I drink a lot of coffee. I've got a bit of a coffee problem. I'm just sipping my third macchiato for the day. So that, that, that helps. <laughs> I don't write on booze or drugs. It doesn't help. It just leaves me into more booze. I'm going to ask, John, what your biggest challenge is right now. What is it that you're dealing with that's causing friction for you at the moment? Oh, that's an interesting question, James. I suppose big picture, macro, is the changing way people consume their media. Obviously, we're the mature phase of the transition from print to digital. There is still an audience for print, I have no doubt. I see people reading the paper every day when I go to my local cafes. But this is a challenge, and I think possibly this means trying to write for people with slightly shorter attention spans who are wanting a slightly more punchy, concise style of delivery. I think we are... A generation of intelligent, educated people are now in their 20s who haven't developed newspaper reading habits at all. They may have developed digital news consumption habits via traditional providers, or they may take their media and their news via aggregators and disruptors who plagiarise what we hardworking journalists working for hardworking publishers produce. Mm. In other words, you know, they plagiarise and steal. These are the sort of the big picture challenges. A smaller picture... I'm very fortunate, James. I've got a really amazing gig at The Australian. I know this sounds a little bit pleased with myself, but I have incredible autonomy to do what I do. And obviously I do more than write about restaurants. I write about producers. I write whimsical pieces. I write about people doing things. I write the occasional news story. But I get complete autonomy. The Australian gives me almost a free hand to travel where I want to travel and spend what I want to spend. There are no dictates from above. Conspiracy theorists have got absolutely, and they're out there, by the way. Oh, of course, I write about what Rupert Murdoch wants to write. That's a joke. And I can't think of once in the last 11 years that anybody has said to me, would you please review this restaurant? So I've got a great gig. I don't go to an office. I work at home. I travel for work. I come home. I don't have a lot of challenges. Having said all that, Many of my former colleagues are now freelancers because jobs in my industry have shrunk so much and it's never been a tougher time to be a freelancer, particularly in the food and wine space because there are so many people who want to do it who are qualified before you even consider everybody wanting to do it has no qualification whatsoever. And rates, freelance rates are terribly low. There's huge competition for the work and people who will publish material unfettered without any commercial reflection are few and far between. There are lots of people who would take freelance work, but you wouldn't be free to say exactly what you wanted to say for fear of upsetting advertisers. Mm. To expand on that then, what does the role of the journalist look like in the future? It certainly looks like being very responsive, more, more responsive than is now the case. Technology allows us to publish almost instantly. Obviously, I can publish, quote unquote, publish instantly on Instagram and so forth, but it's a 24 hour news cycle. That's a cliche, but it's 100% true for the journalist like me who's on staff and expected to be able to respond with a story, you know, within reasonable notice from a whole variety of editors across the organization. It means being ready to accept a commission, research and write and turn something around very quickly. Just before you continue there, Mm. what is quickly in that space now? You can't just appear with copy instantaneously. So what's a sort of a reasonable period that brands or publications or businesses in general are expecting journalists and people like yourself to be turning around these sorts of stories? Well, look, I don't know whether anybody has said this, but I'm sure there is a saying that goes something like haste is the enemy of the truth or facts. I don't know. I mean, I think having trained as a newspaper reporter as a young scamp and then over the course of my career, having done various stints back in news, I think that helps me a lot. I can turn things around pretty quickly. And I think that's no quicker than any other real journalist, but a whole lot quicker than someone who calls himself a food writer. Someone will ring me and say, hey, uh, Channel 10 have just announced who the new MasterChef judges are. Can you give us an opinion piece quickly? I'll think about it and I'll read a few bits and pieces and I'll turn something around within half an hour. You know, I'll give them 500 words half an hour later. That's kind of what is expected in a newsroom. It may not be profound, but it should be accurately correct. It should be what we'd call clean copy. It shouldn't need a whole lot of subbing. It shouldn't have any factual errors. I've never been sued and 
and I don't want to start being sued now. Obviously, we all make factual mistakes every now and then, but I've never been sued for a review. So that's turning it around. And I think it's going to go more and more that way. And of course, I mean, that's before we even discuss how the food and restaurant and chef scene has become so much a part of the vernacular and currency of our daily discussions. 20 years ago, when I worked on Epicure at The Age, people didn't talk about chefs. They didn't make the news. This was for foodies and occasionally a Stephanie Alexander might get a Guernsey or a Neil Perry or what have you. Nowadays, in the era of MKR and MasterChef et al., the news departments are very interested. I mean, you know for yourself, George Calambaris makes headlines every time he puts on a new shirt. This is the stuff that news departments are now interested in, the personality of the food world. So suddenly... Not so much at The Australian, but certainly if you worked on a Herald Sun or a Daily Telegraph, someone is expected to turn around chef stories when there's a controversy such as an alleged underpayment situation or a scandal of some sort. You're expected to be able to turn around stories around these personalities pretty quickly these days and news departments do want them. So um, I'm fortunate, again, working at The Australian, we take a slightly higher brow view of things and they've got a slightly more mature approach to what is news and what isn't news. However, they know our readership is interested in good quality food and the restaurant scene because our readership consumes restaurant products. So we're not immune to that, not at all. Why is the public more interested in food and drink leisure than they were previously? What's driving that change? Such a big question. I mean, you could talk about the democratisation of travel and how once travel was for an elite, but it is now for the masses and therefore everybody's been to Bali and wants to know what a sate is and everybody's been to Greece and wants to know what a Spanakopita is and everybody has travelled now and they bring home great experiences and great memories of great food eaten abroad and want to know more. Television industry has been able to turn food via the mechanism of reality television into a commodity that rates The book industry faced with huge challenges over the past 20 years, which it may be emerging from, I read, but what kept a lot of publishing companies going was food titles, which have held up. So there's a publicity campaign behind food books, and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If Gary Megan is on the telly, on MasterChef, or whatever his new TV show is going to be in 2020, when he does a book, that feeds off that, feeds off that, feeds off that. So, you know, I think democratization of travel, the book publishing industry, is a big part of it. All aspects of the media are learning that this stuff helps sell books, sell newspapers, advertising into podcasts, sells radio content. And Mm. it's been quite interesting to have spanned the last 23 years, mostly talking about food and food people and restaurants, to have seen that change from sort of talking just to people who are interested in dining out to being uh, a much broader audience who all want to know about what an espuma gun is and going back to molecular gastronomy, you know, what making uh, jellies and spheres and you know, all that. Everybody wants to know about what's going on. At a journalism level, I can call an editor and, and I don't need to explain who Andrew McConnell is or Matt Moran or I can say a Morris Tazzini as an example of a restaurateur. These people are now part of the fabric of their cities and one doesn't need to begin by saying, oh, the guy who owns four or five mm-hmm. really excellent restaurants. These things are now givens, which is great. It's like being able to say, oh, you know, a great footballer and not having to explain he's the legendary Sydney Swans full forward. You know, we don't need to explain that. It's a given. And this is good from a journo's point of view. It helps us get stories in the paper, which ultimately, if you're just a writer and not an editor, to some extent, you're being judged on the amount of content that you get published. And if you're a freelancer, you're only paid by the amount of stuff you get published. So either way, these are win-wins. Yes. What's the impact that you would ultimately like to leave on the hospitality industry and, and more broadly, the media? I'd like parts of the hospitality industry to recognise that having someone do their job with a set of balls is actually rather good for them. Having someone do their job who isn't fettered by other commercial interests or different commercial agendas is good for them. To acknowledge that having someone outside their industry looking in and holding a mirror up to them is good for them. But, you know, ultimately that's not who I write for. Ultimately, I don't really care whether the restaurant industry has an an opinion either way about me. I'd really like readers to say... John wrote in an honest, sometimes amusing manner and was completely honest and wasn't afraid to say what needed to be said. And that would be the greatest 
compliment of all. And if I fall in front of a bus tomorrow, you know, I'd like them to say, yeah, we miss John. He wasn't always right, but he was often right. And he wasn't afraid to say what he thought. And that's better than some. So, you know. <laughs> Fantastic. That's kind of what I'd like people to think. And, you know, you still get some nice emails every now and then from people saying, we enjoy what you do. We appreciate that you don't pull punches. And of course, you get people saying that you're completely off the planet. You've completely missed the mark as well. But, you know, it's nice when you do get good feedback. And at the end of the day, I'll remember the good feedback rather than the bad. Yes. John, I just have one last question for you, and that's who would you like to hear on the show? On your show? I'd like to hear people who've got some stories and some history. I'd like to hear someone like Frank Van Handel, for example, who's a restaurateur and an entrepreneur whose name would be well known to Melburnians, but Frank's impact around Australia has been important and he's got a lot of stories to tell. That's an example of someone whose experience, I think, would provide us all with useful anecdotes and useful observations. That's certainly someone who I always enjoy listening to. I have some other people who operate around the hospitality industry whose wisdom I always enjoy. I mean, John Sussman, who's a name that would be well known to you, is someone whose uh, observations I always find insightful and profound even. Yet John manages to celebrate the joy that is the hospitality industry at its best through his business as a marketing consultant to the seafood industry. I think when it comes to talking about your experiences, a solid platform to work from, like a Van Handel or a Sussman, is a pretty good place to start. So let me put it this way. There are some certain young chefs out there who've written autobiographies very early in their careers. I know they didn't sell well, and perhaps on reflection, they might have been saying to themselves, I might have gone off a bit early. I look at a, a Sussman or a Van Handel, and I think to myself, there's someone who's got a story to tell. Mm. Well, thank you very much for your insights today, John. It's been incredible having you on the show. My pleasure, James. It was kind of you to invite me and um, I hope it hasn't been a waste of your time. Not at all. This program is hosted by James Henderson with technical production by Jake Olver. Voiceovers were by Angus Brennan and Shim Phelan. Thanks to our distribution team led by Stephanie Holland and a special thanks to you for tuning in every week. See you soon.